Hello and welcome to the Wellspring Tabernacle Podcast. Wellspring Tabernacle is a Bible-based Trinitarian Christian church in Marble, North Carolina. We seek to impact our community through preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and may God bless. But like I said, for the first, for the past several weeks, we've been talking about spiritual warfare. And um, just a quick recap is the when we started this, we talked about unoccupied territory. And about how... And about how um, the um, Jesus said that there was a time that when a when a when a demon or devil is made to leave someone, they they leave and they walk in desert places, and then they come back to the person they were cast out of, and finding the house, the person empty, and and in the Greek language, it literally means unoccupied. No one lives there. They will go and gather seven friends and come back and come back and set up housekeeping again. Um, then the next week we talked about. Um, what chip is that? What you're after, honey? I think that is. She's after them chips. You can, you can go now. You just can't step on this, honey. <clears throat> And then the next week, we started talking about, uh, out of 2 Corinthians 10, about how the Bible says that the, that we do not fight in the flesh. We don't fight from within ourselves, but we fight from a place of victory through Christ. Um, and this week, we're going to be looking at this, that the sixth chapter of Ephesians. Um... And this is probably the most well-known passage about the topic of spiritual warfare. Um, there have been countless sermons preached, books written, and lessons taught on these few verses in Ephesians. And while some of today's message may be things that you've heard before, I can guarantee that there will be things you haven't heard. I wish she wanted an apple. The topic of spiritual warfare, especially deliverance, are very hot topics as of late. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have seen on various social media sites, um, there's there's actually a movie coming out next month that uh, kind of documents some of these more well-known ministries um, and, and how that they have been focused on deliverance. And... These are very, very popular ministers and very, very popular ministries. And I believe they love Jesus. I believe their intentions come from a place of wanting to honor God and help people. But the results of these ministries are altogether different. You know, I mentioned earlier about talking to my pastor friend over in uh, Copper Hill, Turtle Town area. Um, And he told me that some members of his church had fallen prey to some of the ideas that these ministries propagate. And some of these ideas are that everyone in the church, whether saved or not, is under some form of demonic influence. Now, while this can be true, it isn't normative. Saved people can be attacked and tormented by demonic forces, and lost people can be full-blown possessed. And they also teach that for a person to be a deliverance minister, quote unquote, which is not a biblical gift, ministry, or title, that they have to have special training and go so far as to charge money for this training. Just real quick, let me put a nail in this coffin. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later, he pronounced victory over Satan and every devil in hell. And we, as blood-bought, born-again children of God, fight from the position of the greatest victory ever pronounced over an, en- over an enemy. Victory attained by the captain of the host of the Lord. There's no need for training in how to fight a defeated foe. All we must do is, de- is declare our already won victory in Jesus. The Bible says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in earth and things under the earth. Every devil in hell is an already defeated foe. 
They were and still are defeated by the blood of Jesus and His glorious resurrection. And we're under strict orders to give no place to the devil, Ephesians 4, and to flee the very appearance of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5. Almost all of these so-called deliverance ministries disobey both of these things. Spiritual warfare isn't some mystical, wonky thing, and ministries that participate in things like what I've mentioned above give true warfare a bad name. And this brings us to our text today. In Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, I want, I'll read the whole, the entirety of the passage and then go back up and focus on the first couple of verses, primarily verse 10 uh, today. But the Bible says, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes or wiles of the devil. For our fight or our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places or spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your waist girded with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet fitted or shod with the readiness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, take up the shield of faith which, which you, with which you will be able to extinguish all of the fiery arrows or darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit always with all kinds of prayer and supplication. To that end, be alert with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, like I said, I'm going to go back up here and I want us to hone in today, especially on verse 10. <clears throat> Notice what Paul says first. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If you're not very familiar with the book of Ephesians, Paul has just spent the last five and a half chapters of this book detailing the glory of God and His Christ in the redemption of fallen humanity. And this text today is no different. Paul did not put an exit ramp in Ephesians 6 about demons and spiritual warfare and intend for us to ignore the rest of the book. Rather, this passage further relates to God's plan of, of redemption and the cosmic reconciliation that will be the end result of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and His resurrections. These verses relate to the manner in which we are extracted by God's saving grace in Christ from sin and death and the clutches of Satan. It relates to how we must now live as parents, as redeemed Gentiles and Jews, wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters, given the fact that in this world we live in a war zone that is under attack and being challenged by God's malicious enemy and our enemy, Satan and his network of evil spiritual forces. One writer said that Paul has chosen to recast his message in the form of a battle address in which the whole church is viewed corporately as being in a battle whose ultimate antagonists are God and the devil. The New Testament frequently uses military language to describe the reality of spiritual warfare that accompanies both the cosmic spiritual battle between God and Satan, which is vertical warfare, up and down, and the earthly conflict between believers and the evil spirits of this dark age, which is horizontal warfare. And that's why I have I, I kind of want to title this sermon Fighting Sideways. Amen. The first stage of this horizontal warfare or sideways fight is for us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And this can only be accomplished through the glorious redeeming gospel of Jesus Christ. We have no strength outside of Christ. We have no strength within ourselves. Our strength as believers comes from God. What was it the, the prophet said in the Old Testament? I lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. It is not in our own power we stand, but His 
There's an old song that I've heard before that says, the battle is His, but the victory is mine. And if we lift the lid just, just quickly on a few key words in this verse, we'll find an even deeper description of what Paul is talking about here. The phrase, be strong, is the Greek term in dunamo, and it means to be strong, endued with strength, or empowered. Secondly, we find the word is the word power. This is not the word dunamis where we get dynamite. This is not explosive power, but this is the word kratos, and it means power, might, or mighty with great power. And lastly is the word might. The Greek term here is iskus, and it means ability, force, strength, or might. So if we were to read this verse again with a little more literal rendering, it would say, Finally, my brothers, be endued with strength and empowered by the Lord and in the mighty power of His strength, force, and ability. We as Christians, through the redeeming power of the cross, are to be endued with strength and empowered by the Lord, standing in the mighty power of His strength, His force, and His ability. Why was it that Jesus, at, at, before He ascended, He gave His disciples instructions, and He said, you go into the upper room and you tarry in Jerusalem. You wait until you be endued with power from on high. It's because they had no power in and of themselves. They had to receive strength and power from another world to do the task that they were given. And that has not changed. These people want to say, oh, well, Acts is a descriptive book and we shouldn't get doctrine from that book. I beg to differ with them. Paul told Timothy that all Scripture was breathed out by God and was profitable for doctrine, instruction, and teaching in righteousness. But this verse and the preceding chapters obliterate any possibilities of us being able to do anything remotely effective against the enemy of God outside of Christ. If you go back and you look at Ephesians 2, Paul puts it in it, Paul puts our inability in even greater terms when he says, You were quickened, or the King James says, or brought to life. You have been brought to life who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Paul stresses this idea that we can do nothing within ourselves. Outside of Christ, we can't do anything for the Lord. But, and to many Christians, this is common knowledge. Christ Himself says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains or abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. When we think we can do something on our own, right at that very moment we cease to abide in him. I'm not saying that we lose our salvation or that we we cease to be children of God, but that word abide carries with it this this idea of fellowship. And intimacy with the Lord Jesus. And the very minute that we say, I can do this on my own, we stop abiding in Him. We aren't yoked up with Christ and His will, and we leave ourselves wide open for spiritual attack. We must do, as Paul says, and be strong, endued with power by the Lord and the powerful ability of His might. When we believe that we can go further and deeper than God Himself, we not only open ourselves up for demonic attack, but for demonic influence that will carry us farther than we wish to go. And as charismatic Christians, as people that believe in the the continuity, the continuing of the gifts of the Spirit, we have to be especially careful. Now why? Because we're an emotional, experiential bunch. We love God, we love His Word, and we have great, great zeal, but sometimes in our zealous pursuit, we let our guard down. I've done this myself. This is why Paul says what he does in the next verse, instructing us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to stand against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. 
When we abandon our senses and start to walk away from our firm foundation in Christ, it's because we have failed to put on our armor. All right, we the and the first way that you that you even get to the armor to put it on is by being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If we aren't guarding ourselves with the whole armor of God every day, standing in the power of the strength and might of God, we are doomed for failure. We will very quickly get extremely off track with and in our zeal, becoming zealous for the wrong things. Now let me explain what I mean by that. All right, as an experiential group, as an experiential, but not us experience based, but experienced influenced branch of Christianity, we can become very, very susceptible to the tactics of the enemy. Now, why is that? Because Satan presents himself as an angel of light. And those who do not know any better can be duped into thinking something is of God when it's not. A perfect example is a video i seen of, a, um, of an apostolic Pentecostal or oneness Pentecostal group uh, earlier this week. For those who don't know, oneness Pentecostals deny the Trinity of the Godhead. They are a heretical, unsaved group of people that denies the Trinity of the Godhead. When you fundamentally, and you say, oh, well, that's awfully harsh. You shouldn't say that they're not saved. No, 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 no. When you yeah. deny who God has that's revealed right. himself that's to be right. in Scripture, that's when you deny, when you read the, the account of Christ's baptism. All right, can, can you, somebody says, oh, well, can you show me the Trinity in the Bible? Absolutely, I can. I can't show you the word, but I can show you, I can show you the Trinity in action. Yes. All right, at Christ's baptism, we have God the Son on earth in the water. The Bible says that, lo, the heavens open, and that God the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved Son, and whom I'm well pleased. And then we see God the Holy Ghost descending on him in the likeness of a dove. When you deny that and say, no, that's not, that's not the case, that's not showing a triune Godhead, you have branched off into damnable heresy right. that will lead you to hell. That's it, that's it. But these oneness Pentecostals, they speak in tongues. They prophesy. They anoint with oil over the sick and pray. Mm. They fall out in the spirit. What's the difference? What's the difference? I'll tell you the difference. It. For every good and perfect gift of God in this world, there is a counterfeit. If they can make counterfeit money that will fool cashiers that handle money day in and day out, and they can make counterfeit money that will pass the little marker test that you don't find out it's counterfeit until you take it to the bank and the bank's machine scans it and throws up a red flag saying, hey, something's not right. What makes you think the devil cannot produce That's counterfeit it. miracles? True. And ca That's I mean, true. my God, look at the book of Exodus. When Moses went before Pharaoh yes. and said, let my people go, and, and, and Pharaoh, t and Pharaoh told him, said, well... By whose authority do you say this? And he said, the, the God of the universe. And he throws his staff down yeah. and it turns into a snake. Pharaoh's magicians come up and they put theirs down and they did the same thing. That's right. But there was one time. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what happened? <laughs> Moses' stick ate they the didn't. other one. <laughs> Consumed them. All right. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Well then we come into the we come into the New Testament and we read about people that are false prophets that that can deceive. The Bible says if if it were possible that Satan would deceive the very elect. That's right. All flesh be gone. But we that's why we have to be so so careful. That's right. As charismatics, 
because with with our openness to the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit on display, open us up to be more susceptible to deception than other faith groups, all right? You know, Baptists who are, you know, pretty well closed off to the gifts of the Spirit being practiced, they don't have that problem. Methodists who lost the Holy Ghost a long time ago, you know, well, I, I shouldn't have said that. I God forgive me. They're in but, a routine like a... Like, but, they have, but they've adopted yeah, a routine yeah, yeah. That, that quenches the Spirit does, and grieves does, the Spirit. Um, they, they don't worry about this type of stuff. It is only within that branch of Christianity, and, and it's part of the umbrella that we're under called Pentecostalism, that has to worry about these things. But, on the flip side, we're also the only ones that are sending missionaries to third world countries that are fighting these things. We're the only ones that are sending missionaries to countries where demonic influence is rising by leaps and bounds and are seeing results. Why is that? Because while we are more susceptible to these things, while we can be, you know, quote unquote, duped, by the enemy, it won't last forever because God has promised that the Spirit of God will guide us into all truth. And while we might, with our guard down, be, you know, fall into some deception, it won't be forever. God will bring us back. He won't allow us to do things that, that slander His good name. But, we also can rest assured that God in His grace has given these gifts to His church that we can stand in the Lord and in the power of His might. How do we know that you know, because here's the, here's the thing. We cannot trust our emotions in these things. Just because something makes you emotional does not mean that God is in it. That's right. That's right. That's true. All That's true. the Spirit of God will make you emotional, but not all emotions are produced by the Spirit of God moving on someone. And I think that's where we have to be the most careful is because we'll see some we'll we'll hear something or see somebody that has great zeal and is a very, very moving speaker. Yeah. And we'll just buy into what they're saying because it appears as if God is moving on me. But if what they're I heard I heard a Church of God bishop say this a few years ago he said I his name is Tim something but I cannot remember what what his last name is but he said I don't care who is preaching what or what manifestation they have if they cannot back it up with the word of God I want nothing to do with it and then he made the greatest statement I have ever heard in my life with regard to this type of thing. He said, you cannot be more spiritual than you are scriptural. If you cannot go to the pages of the Word of God and through study and correct interpretation and application of it, say yes this is why I believe and practice what I believe and that's practice it. you better leave it alone that's it that's it that's true that's true so what does it mean to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might well first of all you've got to know that you're born again You've got to know that you believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, was crucified by the Romans, buried in a borrowed tomb, and gloriously resurrected three days later, and now stands as intercessor. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. For mankind, and will save anyone that comes to him by faith. 
Second of all, you have to stand on the Word of God. Before we can have any sort of experiential power, we have to acquaint ourselves with how God has revealed in His Word that that power has moved and operated in the past. Be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. When we elevate experiences as doctrines that are foreign to the Bible, and eventually, when the fun and the rush we're chasing continually leads to disappointment and disaster, we wind up worse off than before we were converted. I speak from personal experience on that. For a long time, I was, I was saved. I was spirit-filled. But God allowed me to get sucked into what I call revival chasing. I didn't have a church home. I did not have, at that point in my life, I didn't have a pastor that I was under. So I was not being discipled. I was just running any and everywhere trying to find something that would puff me up. I wanted to go to the high-octane, high-powered services because that was where God was, or so I thought. But after I left those services, I didn't really receive anything from them that, would, that made a lasting impact or had any lasting effect. And thankfully, God brought me back to the beautiful, beautiful, simple grace of his word I'm telling you if you don't if you don't read the Bible daily you are missing out on one of the greatest graces that God has ever given his people read it if you can't read very well listen to it there's apps that'll read it to you that's right but bathe your mind in the Word of God. Because that is God's Word is the foundation on for everything we, we stand for as a church and as believers. That is everything we have is found and founded in the Word of God. So if we're going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, we better be doing it biblically. That's right. But this is why we must stand in Christ and Christ alone. It's His power, His might, and it's even His armor. And we'll find that out in coming weeks as we get as we get further in to this text. But stand in it, stand on it, and never forget to put it on. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this time that you've given us to come together and worship around your word, God. And we pray, Lord, that we would take my feeble attempts at ministering to these people, God, and you give the increase. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do in this church and in these people go with us now into our time of fellowship in Jesus name Amen Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wellspring Tabernacle Podcast if you feel led to do so please give us a review on the platform of your choice and if you would like to reach out to us further please email us at wellspringtabernaclenc at gmail.com. Until next week, may God bless you.